That's the sound of seven straight bets hitting in a row. That's the sound of three UFC event sweeps in a row. We're blazing hot right now. We're going into this upcoming card uh, with a lot of momentum. We're going to be capitalizing. I see some spectacular spots already to capitalize on. Uh, this is going to be another profitable event. I'm feeling really good right now. You guys know how it goes, man. There's ups and downs throughout this, this, this game uh, of betting on MMA. And right now, I'm appreciating... Uh, the work that we've been putting in because we're really bringing in some money, contemplating grabbing a boat. What do you guys think? Uh, should I get a nice little 30 footer, uh, get on my Conor McGregor shit? And uh, things are things are good right now. Um, like I said, this upcoming event, UFC Austin, I see some spectacular spots to capitalize on. We'll be talking about them here coming up. We're going to do a recap of UFC 275. We had two official plays. We hit both of them. We had an underdog spot. We'll be talking about that underdog spot that we capitalized on, a first-round knockout victory. I'm excited for today's episode. Uh, this video should be coming to you guys as a premiere once again. Hopefully, you guys are all in the chat section right now chatting it up. Engage. Please do engage. Hit, hit up the comment section if you're watching this after the fact. But if you're watching this as a, a premiere, uh, you know, bounce ideas with each other, bounce ideas off each other, hit up the comment section either way. I appreciate you guys hit that like and subscribe. Let's get to it. It's another day, yeah. left jab, right jab, this is MMA. MMA. Mixed martial arts, quick body parts, undefeated when I pick a mooded champ, mooded victim, looking in my crystal ball, I predict the winner. Yeah. Never stop fighting, if you lose, keep your chin up. Keep your chin know up. how the game go, I'm a small fella. Uh -huh. Welcome to the show, this the MMA fortune teller. Yeah. The MMA fortune, MMA fortune teller. The teller. The teller. The teller. The teller. The teller. What is up, you guys? UFC Austin. If you guys didn't realize, we have a solid card here taking place this upcoming Saturday. A lot of intriguing matchups. Uh, some real talent all throughout the card. Uh, so if you again, if you didn't realize, you got a treat uh, taking place this upcoming Saturday. Definitely some solid spots to make money all throughout this card. I truly believe that. I'm not just saying that, guys. There's some there's some solid spots to make money. This is one of those cards that I really, really feel is going to be profitable. And again, that's coming in off three profitable events. Uh, I feel more confident about this event uh, than, than some of those other three events. So uh, we'll, we'll see how it plays out. We'll be jumping into every single fight moving forward. You guys know how this uh, show goes. There, there will be timestamps all, th all throughout the, uh, the show here. Uh, we have those new time cards, so you should be able to uh, see them right as you glaze over this video if you're watching this after the premiere hopefully you guys are tuning in uh, for the premiere here and you guys are all engaging like I, I talked about in the intro um we got josh emmett taking on calvin cater two top uh top 10 featherweight fighters uh two very talented guys that have uh grenades for a fist they could put anybody out with, at any given time in a fight uh it has all the makings to be an explosive fight um we'll take a quick look throughout the card uh and the co-main event we got donald cerrone taking on taking on joe lozon that fight was supposed to take place just a couple weeks ago uh we, we remember donald cerrone had uh, some type of stomach bug and the fight was pushed back here so um some of you guys probably probably remember how i feel about the fight uh kevin holland taking on tim memes joaquin buckley taking on albert duryov uh we got a lot of a lot of exciting fights some real talent in De uh, demir ismagulov and guram uh, kutat lazi uh, the georgian fighter uh excuse me on the pronunciation that's a tough one there uh gregory rodriguez adrian yanez jeremiah wells uh i mean th this card really is filled with talent um and all the way to the first fight which we'll be jumping to here in a second phil hawes taking on duran win another fight that was supposed to take place a while back uh that was rescheduled here and uh, i'm excited about that fight too you guys know the routine though let's take a look back at ufc 275 let's see where we went right well, let's see where we went wrong uh, there was no wrong for me as far as from a betting standpoint uh from from overall picks we'll talk about some of those hopefully you guys all made out well uh most importantly from a betting standpoint and that's what we're here to do make money and uh, let's slide over there. So in the first fight of UFC 275, we had Jocelyn Edwards taking on Ramona Pasqual. Personally, I felt that Ramona Pasqual uh, took rounds one and two. 
Uh, round one, Jocelyn Edwards started a little bit quicker. She landed some good shots in the feet early. Was throwing some nice kicks and whatnot, good movement. But uh, the, the attack that Ramona put out at the end of that round, in my opinion, was more than significant enough to take that round. Uh, if you guys remember, she was working the body. She hurt Edwards bad in the body. She was landing knees there, threw some kicks. And I felt that the striking exchanges early on were even enough that that damage definitely outweighed that. And I thought Pasquale took the second round and then Edwards took the third round. Um, a unanimous decision for Edwards. I was a little confused there. A lot of people agreed with me there. Uh, I got a message from Sasha Palatnikov who trains with Ramona Pasquale. He was upset about that. Uh, in the next fight, Silvana Gomez Juarez uh, knocks out not Liang. Uh, we didn't pick this fight correctly. I thought and with no confidence at all, if you guys remember, but I thought there was a possibility Na Liang's aggressiveness and submission skills could have gave Juarez uh, some problems. But we know that Juarez is a decent athlete and she does carry some good power. If she was going to win the fight, this was definitely a way she could have won the fight. We saw her drop the Demopolis on the feet. Now she knocks out Liang here. Uh, good victory for her there. Chung Ho Kong takes out uh, Dana Batgarel. Uh, I'm very happy that I stayed away from betting on this fight because I did uh, contemplate it at one point in time. I like the uh, the aggressiveness and the power that Batgarel has, but there was some red flags. And of course, that being that he just was recently knocked out. And, uh, and yeah, he wasn't knocked out in this fight, but you guys have to realize when somebody gets devastatingly knocked out like they just did like that recently... Uh, when they go into the fight, they might be a little bit more hesitant. And you saw Bakarel very hesitant in this fight. Um, and Hyo Hong, Hyo, Hyo ha, excuse me there, Hyung Ho Kong is, is a guy that's a very talented striker, throws uh, nice straight shots. And we talked about that as well, right? The straight shots of, of him may be uh, landing a little bit more crisp than, than the, the looping power shots from Bakarel. So I stayed away from that fight. Hopefully you guys all did as well. Now, the official action kicks off here. Uh, wait till you guys hear my two-leg parlay. I, I'm sure some of you guys are going to have something to say about it, but uh, I did put a two-team together here, a two-team uh, parlay, and the first leg was Brendan Allen. This fight played out a lot closer than I than I wanted it to or that I thought it would have. I thought Allen would have been able to handle uh, the, the relentless grappling pressure of Malcolm better, uh, but Allen was looking a little slow out there, and I'm, I'm, I'm off the Allen train a little bit for that performance, but I did think... He did enough to get the job done. It was extremely close. You guys have to understand something here. The judges are not valuing holding on, uh, fighters holding on to their opponent and just hanging on them against the cage and eventually getting a takedown or two, not doing any type of damage, not throwing any type of shots while they're grappling. We saw it, and we're going to get to another fight later. And we, we knew that this was something that changed recently. So you have to understand that when we're betting on these fights, take that into consideration. It's only going to benefit you. If you know there's a fighter that, that could potentially get some takedowns but really doesn't do any damage at all, and if he's really not going to be able to hold the other fighter for five minutes straight there, you might not feel as confident as as betting on them. Now, here you were getting underdog odds on Malkoon. So if you felt like you, there was value there, uh, no shame on that. But I thought Allen did enough, uh, took the third round. And then that big judo throw that he had where he got in mount, I think that was the other round he took. So uh, the leg, uh, the first leg hits. Now we go to a straight play right here, a plus 150 uh, bet. Uh, my boy, Hayasar Mahashate, uh, grabbed it at plus 150, two units. I could not believe that the line was like this. You guys know how I felt about this fight. You heard the prediction, the, the, the breakdown last week. Uh, why was Mahashate an underdog going into this fight against Steve Garcia? Mahashate is a legitimate fighter. He has real talent. He's a stud striker. He's working on his takedown defense and actually has a wrestling pedigree that not a lot of people even realize. People were questioning his wrestling abilities. Steve Garcia hasn't shown anything, and I don't understand why there was money coming in on Steve Garcia. I grabbed Mahashate as high as plus 175 right before the fight started and threw a hefty wager on that. Uh, so a lot of money came in there. Uh, and as you guys saw, if you guys follow me on IG, MMA Fortune Teller underscore go follow me. I actually posted this two-team parlay before the second fight even took place which we'll be getting to here in a second. Um, but Kuli Bao looked great. Got the split decision over Sang Woo Choi. I thought he should have won the unanimous decision. He won the first two rounds, did big damage. Jack Della Madalena takes out Ramazan Amiv. This was a play I hesitated on. I was very close to pulling the trigger on Jack Della Madalena. And, uh, you know, if you're really looking to Jack's resume, not a lot of experience against tough grapplers, tough wrestlers, and lower level competition. Uh, you know, he fought the striker on Dana White's Contender Series. He fought another striker that was only 4 no as a pro in his UFC debut. Ramazan Amiv's not a joke. Ramazan Amiv almost had that sub. 
All right, let's be honest now. Uh, but but great work for Jack to defend that, get back up to the feet and get the, the knockout there, working the body. Uh, Jake Matthews gets the knockout over Andre Fialo. That was a fun fight. Jake Matthews looked amazing out there. Big props to him. A lot of people were on Fialo. I picked Fialo to win the fight. Thought it was close, but um, Jake Matthews, man, that's the Matthews that I want to see moving forward, and he's still young. So you guys know we talked about the fact that his mom reserved the octagon uh, to to deliver him. So we know that he's he has a world of experience in the octagon, and, and he has a world of of time ahead of him. So let's see how far he could push it. Uh, Wheelie Zhang gets the knockout over Yuan Young Jacek. That was crazy. The spinning back fist knockout. What'd you guys think about that knockout there? And you and a young J check retires. And uh, I had a feeling she was going to retire after that loss. I, I was kind of feeling those types of vibes. She's getting up there in age and, and that was it. You know, she, if she would have won that fight, she could have fought for the belt after this, but uh, she, she's always partying and she's always on the beaches and stuff. And she's a, a girl that likes to enjoy her life and let her move on to the next chapter of her life. Valentina Shevchenko defeats Talio Santo, Talia Santos. All right, guys. Now, this was the other leg of my parlay. A very close fight. I thought Shevchenko did enough to take one of those first three rounds. Um, Santos, again, was hanging on her. Uh, Santos had some moments, though. She really did flash with her grappling. I'm very impressed from, from uh, what she put out there. Um, I still felt that, that Shevchenko took one of those rounds because Santos just didn't try to throw any strikes when she was getting in those dominant positions. She should have just tried to try to step up uh, the, the activity of just landing a couple elbows, just throwing a couple shots. And then Shevchenko was constantly uh, throwing shots. Even when she had her back taken, she was landing nasty shots, uh, you know, throwing them over her shoulder. So the judges, they, they score points for that type of stuff. And then, of course, Shevchenko took rounds four and five. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you guys feel Santos won the fight. I've been hearing about it, but it was an extremely close fight. And this is why you don't target these types of lines. I got away with it here. You, you know, I said it right in my bet right up. I don't usually target these types of high lines. I, I just knew Shevchenko was going to get the job done. But look, I was playing with fire there. Uh, it was a very close fight. And uh, at the end of the day, though, the five unit play cashes was a minus 174 two team parlay. Major units come in again. We had the underdog spot on the Mashate fight, another profitable event. That's three events in a row. That's seven bets in a row where we're on absolute fire. I'm telling you guys, man, I've been killing it with the tape. I got my new setup over here. Uh, as you guys see, I'm working on things and, and I'm putting in a lot of time uh, cramming tape. And speaking of cramming tape, a fight I cannot wait to watch back, the Yuri Prajaka. Uh, Prohashka, let me get that right. Yuri Prohashka, put some respect on the champion's name. Defeats Glover Teixeira with that that fifth round uh, rear naked choke. Didn't even have the hooks in. And um, listen, that fight was one of the best fights that I've ever witnessed. Uh, what a pleasure to watch that fight. What a war. Glover Teixeira was 30 seconds away from winning the fight. Made a mental error in there. If we're being honest, I felt like both men made a lot of mental errors. And both men were... were fighting very recklessly, which I was surprised to see Glover do that more so. Uh, this fight was on the table for both men to to claim if they would have slowed things down and been more cerebral in there. I felt that that Prohashka could have got the finish if he would have slowed things down. There was times Glover was on his back and, and Prohashka let him stand up when he was doing significant damage early when he was fresh, when he was able to stack the guard and throw heavy shots down. There was a lot of mental errors, a lot of reversals, a lot of transitions, but what a treat of a fight. And we got a new champion and Yuri Prohashka, the, the Czech Republic uh, fighter there. And uh, I'm very excited to see him uh, potentially take on Jan Blakovich next. So how did you guys do on this event? I hope you guys, uh, I hope you guys all made some good money there. And uh, hopefully my, my last video helped you guys do that. And now we move forward to UFC Austin. So Phil Hawes taking on Duran Wynn. Uh, we already broke down this fight a while back. And remember now, this fight was supposed to take place... Um, We'll, we'll pull it up here. This fight was actually supposed to take place initially uh, back in 2021, uh, about a year ago. Uh, and then it was rescheduled again in October. It fell through again. And uh, now here we are. Hopefully it goes through. Uh, you guys know my thoughts on this fight. This is a very tough fight for Deron Wynn. Deron Wynn is extremely undersized. He has a very odd frame for the division. Um, he's a guy that we saw fight up at the light heavyweight division, I do believe, right? At the Oscar De La Hoya promotion or one of those other promotions. I think he fought even up there. I don't know why he doesn't make the cut uh, down to welterweight or lightweight, uh, the five foot six. 
uh, middleweight fighter Duran Win. We know that he has some solid wrestling abilities. We understand that. Of course, he's a guy that's putting a lot of work with DC. You know, training over at AKA for a long time. His wrestling is very much up to par. He's very technical, uh, cuts corners very, very well. And if you're not up to par there, yeah, he will take advantage of that, and he will get some takedowns, and and he can string out a division on you, uh, string out a decision on you. Um, remember what we talked about earlier, though, with, with the judges really not. Uh, giving credit so much to uh, the, the takedowns and the control there as much as the damage. Well, you talk about a guy that puts damage out, Phil Hawes, a devastating striker, big-time knockout power, uh, and underrated takedown defense and underrated grappling, okay? that That's that's the thing with Phil Hawes. Now, there was something that I, I a certain way I felt about Phil Hawes back in the day. I felt he used to gas out a little bit. If you guys remember the Marquez fight, he gassed out in that fight, got knocked out. I don't feel... That, that's an issue here. He's shown recently to really have some great conditioning. Uh, but the issue is his chin. That's the issue. Uh, again, knocked out in his last fight uh, against uh, Curtis, who's, who's been really putting things together. But again, although Curtis has been putting things together and he's a devastating striker, Phil Hawes has a, a long history of getting starched on the feet. And although Duran Wynn has no types of knockouts like that, in fact, I think he only has two knockouts on the feet dating back to the very beginning of his career, fights that were against guys that have losing records. So I don't really see the threat there, but I'll tell you what, Bill Hawes, his chin is pretty bad. And there's definitely the possibility that Wynn does land that shot. There's a possibility. Um, but at the end of the day, I think that Haas will avoid that big shot. Uh, Haas will have a seven and a half inch reach advantage. I think Henry Hooft will be working with him, using working on the footwork, making sure he keeps the distance, doesn't engage and, and that type of threat. Stuffs the takedowns, land some big shots from the outside. And I think he could really put it on Duran Wynn. I think he could hurt him bad. And we'll see Duran Wynn uh, shooting with some reckless shots, some some desperate shots. And I think that Phil Haas will stuff all those and, and Phil Haas will land some big shots. Potentially, he gets to finish. I could see Wynn in, in a vulnerable situation and potentially being finished. Uh, so I will take Phil Haas to win that fight. And uh, right now, Phil Haas is right around, is on Bavada.lv, a minus 250 with the comeback under on win at plus 200. Uh, I mean, that, that's a, Phil Huss is a pretty solid favorite there, but I, I think I feel pretty confident he gets the job done here. So, I mean, if you were looking to throw that in a parlay or something like that, I wouldn't be opposed to it. But do understand that Phil Huss can can get touched and be put out. And again, he's coming off a knockout loss too. So uh, where he was just knocked out uh, six months ago. So imagine when lands that big shot, but I, I just don't see it happening. Uh, Phil Haas gets the job done. In the next match, we got Roman Delize. Look at him over here. Deuce Bigelow, male gigolo, uh, taking on my boy, Kyle Dawkins. You guys know I had the interview with Kyle, a, a real class act. You see Roman over here flying an airplane. Uh, I don't know where this is, maybe in Georgia or whatever. He brings these girls back to his homeland. The, the word is he's, he's taking all the UFC girls. You guys know the story. With Cheyenne Vlismus snagged up his, his own uh, fellow gym member's wife and, and Cheyenne. You guys know I had the whole video that I did. I had to take it down. I was getting messages from Cheyenne Vlismus. Things were getting crazy. Um, and now look at Roman here. Roman's working on Claudia Gedalia and Antonina Shevchenko at the same time. Look at this guy. He has the beard. He flies airplanes. I mean, this, this, is, the, this is the Deuce Bigelow of the UFC, man. Um, again, though, back to Kyle Dawkins, a class act. Uh, just a really, really good dude that's just been working on his craft. He's all business. You know, he has the longtime wife. He's not distracted with anything like that. He's just focusing on fighting. Him and his brother have been, do, been putting in work. Um, you know, when we look at this matchup here, both of these guys, very, very large frames for the division, which is good to see as far as uh, Kyle Dawkins being able to match up with Roman. Roman's a guy that's really been uh, the much larger fighter in some of his fights. He's kind of shadowed over his opponents. He's a big dude, six foot two with a 76 uh, inch reach. Uh, Dawkins will be able to match him there with that, that 76 reach as well. Uh, and Dawkins is actually an inch taller. Um, Dawkins has been looking silky smooth on the feet as of recently. People underestimate and undervalue the work that he did against Kevin Holland due to that headbutt. He was looking amazing in that fight. He was taking that fight. It was unfortunate I wasn't able to cash that underdog bet, uh, but it was what it was. It ended up being a draw, or excuse me, a no decision. But in his last fight, he goes out there, pulls the darts on Jamie Pickett. Um, again, I bet I've been pleased with the work I've been seeing from Kyle Dawkins. Uh, the way I see this fight playing out, I see Dawkins uh, being a little bit, a little bit more accurate on the feet. 
a little bit more fluid with his movement and his footwork. Delize is a guy, uh, he does have some big power, but the more the fight goes on, we've been seeing Delize get a little bit, um, a, a little bit clunky. Uh, that's a good word to describe. He gets clunky and he slows down a little bit. Uh, I really didn't think he looked good in that Trevin Giles fight. He really slowed down in that fight. Um, now in that Giles fight, uh, yeah, he did take the L there. Some people thought that he won that fight, but I thought that he lost that fight. Giles outworked him late. Uh, he bounced back with the victory over Loreno Steropoli, a guy that really kind of fell off. And I don't even know if the fell off's the word. He just never really lived up to the potential that he could have had. Uh, Kyle Dawkins has been living up to the potential. He's 29 years old. I expect Dawkins to be more fluid in the striking exchanges. And when it goes down to the mat, I think Dawkins will be the fresher fighter. And with his jujitsu skills, I think he can give Delize some problems there. Uh, Delize is a very strong, powerful guy. He'll try to throw some bombs at Dawkins. He'll try to, uh, you know, get the better of the, of the grappling exchanges with his power and his brute strength. I think that the fluidity and the skill set of Dawkins will, will prevail here. We'll go. We'll take a look at the the betting line, and you're looking at a line right now on Dawkins at, at minus two thirty. So people are really respecting Dawkins in this spot. Uh, people have been respecting Dawkins. Um, you know, he came in as a big favorite again in his last fight. And there's been a couple spots where he's came in as a pretty big favorite. I think the line is slightly off here. If I'm being honest, I think that Delize is a threat. Yeah, he's, he's a powerful fighter and he's a skilled fighter. I think Dawkins gets the job done, but I was a little surprised to see the betting line of minus 230 next to Dawkins' name. I thought maybe a minus 185 would have been a little bit more accurate, but nevertheless, I think Kyle Dawkins gets the job done. And, um, he he may get this he may get the job done via submission. Keep an eye on that as well. Maybe a third round sub late in the fight. Cody Stamen taking on Eddie Wineland. Uh, Eddie Wineland. Let's talk about Eddie here for a second. If you didn't realize, you know Eddie, the former WEC champion, a guy that's been around the block for a long time. He's definitely up there in age now. Eddie Wineland was was just always a fun fighter to watch. Always a stud. Um, if you were one of the old, if you're an old school MMA fan and you remember the WEC days, you guys know what I'm talking about. Eddie Wineland was a staple of the, uh, of the WEC. He was a guy that, that always went in there and threw down a very ta talented, well-rounded fighter, uh, definitely favors his striking. He likes to go out there and, and put dudes out. Uh, he's aggressive, but he's way past his prime and he's fighting in a division where it's really hard, uh, to get away with with being up there in age and, and he doesn't like what i had to say there as you see he's flicking me the bird here uh still looks to be in good shape but it's not about really the shape you're in in this division you just you lose a little bit of, of speed and and awareness and just um just just seeing shots coming at you quick enough i mean we saw what happened to him in the sean o'malley fight he froze up got starched um this is going to be a tough fight for him because cody statement has underrated boxing a very well-rounded fighter uh he, he could wrestle uh, I think he has the advantage as far as the the grappling goes. I could see him getting some takedowns, putting in some work down there on the feet. I could see him closing in, closing the distance and landing some big shots against Eddie. And right now we're talking about Eddie Wineland that was just knocked out by John Castaneda, just knocked out by Sean O'Malley. He had the knockout over uh, Grigori Popov, but before that loses to Alejandro Perez and John Do John Dodson. Um, I th you know ha he hasn't been that active. He's averaging a fight per year. Uh, he still wants to throw down one more time before he turns 38, which is just a couple days away. And I think that he has a good relationship with the UFC and he was able to talk his way into one more fight. Without a doubt, this is, will be his last fight if he loses here. And I do see him losing here. Um, uh, the only way I see him winning in this fight is if he lands some type of big shot and really puts Stamen on Queer Street and Stamen doesn't rebound and Eddie Wineland can can kind of steal a decision like that or maybe gets that knockout shot, which I just don't even see happening. But th those are the only uh, real possibilities. I think that Stamen's the better fighter. Stamen's hungry right now. Uh, he's 32 years old. He's in the prime of his career. He just lost three fights, but look at the level of competition. Saad Nurmagomedov, who's a stud. Uh, Marab uh, Davashili, a stud. Uh, Jimmy Rivera, a stud fighter. That was a close fight. And then before that, he styles on Brian Kelleher and uh, went to a, a, a draw with the Adong Song. Do understand that that Cody, uh, his brother, you know, unfortunately, man, it's really sad. His brother did commit suicide just a couple years ago, right when all this was all that this little streak was going on. I believe it might have been right around the Kelleher fight or whatnot. Um, a, really, a horrible situation, man. A young uh, stud, stud dude, man, for whatever reason, chose to take his life, and obviously that weighed a lot on Stamen. So you had you have to wonder where his mental's been at over the last couple of years. God willing, you you would hope that that he's in a way better place right now uh 
being that it's, it's been, he's had some time to recover. Not saying that you ever fully recover from that, but he's had some time. It's been a couple of years now. I think that he has to be really hungry to go out here and make a statement. And I think he takes out uh, Eddie Wineland. And don't be surprised if he gets the knockout on the feet as well. All right, we take a look at the betting line on this fight. You're going to expect Stamen to be a big favorite, and he is going to be a big favorite. He's a minus 500 uh, going into this fight. And honestly, that's a high line. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really touch it if it goes any higher, but if you want to throw it in a parlay, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't judge you on that. Not saying that's necessarily what I would do. Maybe I would, maybe I wouldn't. Stay tuned. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't judge you uh, on that based on the fact that I feel pretty damn confident Stamen's going to go in here and get the job done. And Wineland's a guy that's just getting an opportunity to fight in the octagon when he probably really shouldn't be. All right. So Cody Stamen to win the fight. I think he, he, I think he finishes the fight. Danny Chavez taking on Ricardo Ramos. Now we know Danny Chavez uh, is a fighter that is lacking no confidence. You know, we had him on the show. We chatted it up with him. He's a fighter that said he wanted, wants to be a triple champ in the UFC, not a double champ. That's not enough. He wants to be a triple champ. Now he might want to start with just becoming a single champ first. But again, I love the confidence. I love the confidence. I love his personality. And uh, he was one of the more uh, enjoyable conversations I've had on MMA live discussion. Uh, I think he is a, a solid fighter. He, he has some sharp striking, really. He lands really nice leg kicks. He actually said uh, when I had the interview with him that his gym and where he came from at MMA masters, they, they started the calf kick. He's been doing the calf kick way before all these other guys have been doing it recently. So, um, just understand he really likes to, to land that calf kick. That's a, a maneuver we know can, absolutely uh, take, take an opponent out very early, can, can really uh, wither them and, and not, allow their, not allow the opponent to, to have any type of offense just being damaged and whatnot. And uh, if things could play out like that for Chavez, that would really be a treat for him because Ricardo Ramos has some spectacular offense. He's a stud striker. He'll land spinning attacks on you. Uh, he'll throw beautiful one-twos straight down the pipe. Um, you know, he, he really put his name on the map to me when he fought uh, Hyung Ho Kong back in the day, and he won that fight via split decision. We saw Kong just recently uh, bounce back in the UFC with the victory, uh, showcasing his nice straight shots, beautiful, uh, beautiful jab, a beautiful straight, and you know that's something that's very underrated in the fight game right now. A fighter that could throw nice straight shots down the pipe, Ricardo Ramos can do that, but he can also hit you uh, with, with a, a nasty, um, a nasty spinning attack as well, which we've seen him throw a couple of those. Um, Ricardo Ramos, only 26 years old. It's funny because I was just thinking about him a couple weeks back. I was like, when's Ramos getting back in there before I pulled up this fight? Uh, still very, very young. Has a lot, a lot of potential still. I know he's coming off the loss uh, to Tukigov. Before that, took out Bill Algio, an underrated fighter. Um, this is a fun fight right here. This is a really fun fight. Uh, I lean Ricardo Ramos. Ramos, based on the fact that I like his reach advantage. I like the length advantage he has here. I could see him... Uh, landing his own leg kicks and just kind of uh, kind of putting Danny Chavez in a tough spot where, where Danny can't close the distance. We've seen him in that situation before where he's trying to land and Danny could be a little hesitant at times and he kind of uh, hesitates to, to really go in and close the distance and, and land uh, land his shots, which he's a fighter that comes in undersized a lot and it bites him in the butt sometimes when he does that. If he's going to go out here and take this fight, he's going to be a, have to be a little bit more aggressive and He's going to have to take some more chances. He's going to really have to go in and close that distance, which is going to open him up to being hit hit as well. Um, I have a feeling that he'll be hesitant uh, a little bit much so again, and I think that Ramos will land from the outside, and I think Ramos takes this fight. Uh, I expect this fight to be a striking war, uh, or I wouldn't. I don't even know if I'd call it a war. It should be. It'll be a fun striking match, uh, but I think Ramos will get the better. Uh, of Chavez here. I think Chavez will be a little bit too hesitant. Ricardo Ramos at minus 325. From a betting standpoint, I'm not necessarily crazy about Ramos at that line. I think maybe more value on, on Danny Chavez, but I think Ramos gets the job done. Um, Ramos coming in at a minus 325 uh, when he's coming off a not, uh, excuse me, a loss to Tukigov six months ago. Um, yeah, it's a pretty high line, but I think it should be more like minus 280, minus 275, but Ramos gets the job done from the outside. And again, real quick, guys, let me let me mention, uh, we're talking about a five-inch reach advantage for Ricardo Ramos, a five-inch reach advantage against a guy in Chavez who he can be hesitant and stay on the outside a little too much. Gloria Dapala taking on Maria Oliveira. Maria Oliveira, 
one fight in the UFC, one loss in the UFC. Uh, before that, two fights that she was able to win, a knockout victory over Anila Tabosa. Uh, we know that she had an opportunity on Dana White's Contender Series as well, uh, almost four years ago, one of the first... Uh, one of the f the first episodes, I do believe, of Dana White's Contender Series towards the beginning of that first season. And um, she lost that fight, but it was against Marina Rodriguez. So no shame there. Um, Gloria DePaula, she's a girl, in my opinion. She's a very talented fighter, but she's kind of missing something uh, with, with her defense. She freezes up a little bit. Uh, she'll throw some nice shots, but she kind of freezes up and pauses, and she's vulnerable to be attacked back. Uh, we saw her freeze up against Cheyenne Vlismas and get her head punted uh, across the, the octagon. Um, she has some decent jujitsu skills, some underrated jujitsu jiu skills. I don't believe she has any uh, submissions there, but she's capable. Um, this is a tricky fight, uh, and again, based on the fact that Gloria freezes up, I expect Gloria uh, to be the more polished striker. She'll throw more straight shots. They'll have more pop on them, more zing on them. Uh, Oliveira, uh, when, you, when you watch tape on her, she's tough. Uh, she'll, she'll hang in there, but she kind of throws looping shots a little bit. She's not really the most talented on the feet, but she's tough. Um, if Oliveira can, can weather the storm, she'll get teed off on a little bit. Gloria will be the, the better athlete. She'll be better in the striking department. But if Oliveira can weather that storm, I could see Oliveira clipping Gloria with the shot on the comeback and, and maybe doing some damage there. Uh, that, that is one way I could see Oliveira get, getting something going. Um, but overall, Gloria DePaula is the more talented fighter. And I like her striking better as far as from an offensive standpoint. Her offensive striking is better. That's why I'm going to pick Gloria DePaula to win the fight. And uh, look at Maria Oliveira. Look at her, well, not this one, but the last one. She's sticking her tongue at you. Uh, you know, she's trying to make a little bit of a name for herself uh, in women's mixed martial arts. But she's got to win some fights first before she's taking bikini pictures in the bathroom and whatnot. And uh, and and Gloria is a little bit of a tough matchup for her, um, just because I think that she is the better striker. But she'll have that avenue to potentially clip Gloria with the shot and do some damage. We've seen Gloria have some issues there. Uh, let's see the line on this. I, I'm expecting Gloria, or excuse me, I shouldn't say that. I already know Gloria is a, a big favorite here, minus 265. That line is off to me. Uh, I think that Gloria should be like a minus 170 to like a minus 185. I think that she gets the job done. But if you want to take that shot on the fact that DePaula's striking defense is lacking again and she gets clipped or she gets tagged up a little bit, uh, make some mental errors, some mental miscues in there. Maria Oliveira can take this fight. So definitely more value on the underdog, in my opinion here. But Gloria DePaula is the better fighter and probably gets the job done at the end of the day. Another women's mixed martial arts fight here. Jasmine Jessa DeVicki is taking on the UFC newcomer Natalia Silva. Natalia Silva, 12-5-1. She's on a little bit of a winning streak. Her last loss uh, came by way of Marina Rodriguez, a fighter that we know is very talented in the UFC right now. She's at the top of the division. Uh, Natalia Silva, when you look at what she's been doing recently, it, it kind of looks better than what you've seen, what I've seen on tape, really, in my opinion. The fact that she was able to go uh, to a decision with Marina Rodriguez, that does say something. Uh, and then stringing off six victories in a row, pulling off submissions, uh, four uh, arm submissions, uh, an arm lock, and then three arm bars. It looks impressive. Uh, she has a good amount of experience. Uh, the fight with Marina Rodriguez, she was actually able to kind of weather the storm on the feet. She was using her footwork, and she was kind of switching stances and hanging with Marina Rodriguez there to an extent. It, it, it's, it sounds decent, but at the same time, her striking has no type of pop on it, in my opinion. And uh, she's not the best athlete. She's one of those girls, if you know what I'm saying, she's she's kind of like fluffy with her movement, and, and she's not that crisp and powerful. Um, and I think that Jasmine has an avenue to go out here and take the fight. I've been impressed with what I've seen from Jasmine. She's a decent striker herself, but she's a powerful powerful girl. She's strong. Uh, we saw her in the Kay Hansen fight, sneaking takedowns in, uh, working so working some control time down on the mat. She's very tough in the clinch. She's very active. She's an aggressive fighter. And uh, I could see her kind of bullying Natalia a little bit in the clinch and just being the stronger fighter. Uh, she has a three-inch height advantage. I expect her to have the reach advantage as well, even though we don't have the reach here on Natalia Silva. I think Jessa DeVickis is the bigger girl, and uh, I think that's going to help her prevail here. Now, Jessa DeVickis also only has eight professional fights. Uh, even though she got into the game late, she's 33 years old. 
So she's kind of in the prime of her physical abilities. And and as far as her, her learning curve, learning mixed martial arts, it's starting to catch up. And I think you're going to see her really have some success uh, in the upcoming year or two. Um, she's going to be more comfortable inside the octagon now. She had that Dana White's cont contender series fight where she took out Julia uh, Palastri. And, and now she's going out here, or she went out there and she got an official UFC victory over Kay Hansen, a girl that was very hyped up. Uh, I think that Jasmine now will, will go out here with a lot of confidence. And uh, I think that she gets the job done. I think that she will slightly get the better of the striking exchanges there. It'll be close, but she'll close the distance like that. She'll work uh, a dirty clinch game. And I think that she'll be physically stronger uh, than, Natal than Natalia. Uh, that's kind of how I see the fight playing out. Um, and I will say this as well. And you see Natalia with the donkey donk there. Uh, if you run that back, there you go. But besides the donkey donk, uh, Natalia, although I did say that she was looking fluffy and, and, and soft it with a lot of her striking, I will say that some of the tape that I did watch on her was a couple years ago. Uh, the Marina Rodriguez fight was all the way back in 2017, where I really wasn't a fan of what I saw on the feet. Um, there was another fight that I just watched recently here as well, but she's had some time to, to work on her game. Her last pro fight was in 2019. So that's three years ago. And again, you see her hitting the, 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 the bag there. I'm sure she's been working on her striking. So there's the potential. She looks a little bit better there, but I'm not going to say that, that I'm going to give her an edge based on that. She's had more time to train when she hasn't been active fighting as a pro you know there's been a three-year layoff that's not necessarily an edge to me and jasmine's been active i expect jasmine to get the job done jasmine uh, just a davikius is a minus 250 favorite here over natalia silva it's a little risky in my opinion there's a lot of question marks going into this fight i personally wouldn't want to be touching a minus 250 line but jasmine probably does get the job done so that's one of those those tricky fights that's kind of trying to bait you in um uh, but but you really you don't know exactly how that fight's going to play out. There's some question marks there. The inactivity, uh, a lot of different things going on there. But I think Jasmine gets the job done. She's the, the larger, uh, stronger fighter. Jeremiah Wells taking on Court McGee. This is a fight that I've been very torn on. I've been back and forth on my selection here. But you guys are going to get one live here in a second. Live on the spot. I got to make a decision here. Jeremiah Wells... It is ferocious on the feet. He carries some big time power. Uh, we saw what he was able to do to Warley Alves. He got that knockout there, took that fight on short notice. We know the stories of him in the gym. Paul Felder was talking about the work that he puts in, in, in it puts in, in the gym. He's a savage. Uh, in his last fight, he took out Blood Diamond where he was able to work the grappling. And that fight, he had a game plan. He stuck to it. I liked that, that he did that. And that shows that he's a cerebral fighter. He knew the path to victory was through his grappling, even though he loves to strike, wasn't engaged, engaging in a striking match against Blood Diamond. The, the training partner of Israel Adesanya and them, I do believe. Um, so that, that's something that you like to see there. Uh, in this fight, though, uh, this is a completely different fight than, than a Blood Diamond fight. Court McGee is a well-rounded fighter who obviously his strengths are his cardio, uh, his grappling, the pace that he pushes, and uh, he's a whole different fighter than... than excuse me here, than what Jeremiah Wells' last uh, opponent was. Court McGee, uh, up there in age, 37 years old, fighting in the welterweight division. I do believe he's cut from a, a little bit of a different cloth, though. This is a guy that, that's going to get away with fighting there up in age uh, a little bit more than, than others. First off, look at the shape that he's in going into this fight. This was uh, two days ago. He's in phenomenal shape. Uh, he, he really is in phenomenal shape. Um Coming off two victories in a row, he went out there, outgrappled, and, and pushed the pace on Ramiz Brahimaj, a talented grappler. Before that, took out Claudia Silva. Claudio Silva, uh, Hannibal, is an underrated fighter. So he, he has some momentum now. That's two solid victories in a row. Uh, before that, lost to Carlos Condit. That wasn't the best look. Sean Brady, a stud grappler. Uh, and then Diego Lima, I saw that fight live. That was the first fight of a card that I, I was just walking into the event, I believe, in Sunrise or in South Florida over you know UFC event at the Panthers Arena. And um, I thought that McGee won that fight. And I'll tell you what was going on in that fight. The arena was empty. It was the first fight of the, of the card. And there was a lot of Diego Lima uh, supporters there. And those, those supporters were screaming like crazy whenever Lima did something so slightly. And it skewed the judges 100%. I'm telling you guys. McGee, should, he should have got the nod there. Um, so that all being said, I have a feeling 
Uh, and there's a red flag here we're going to talk about real quick with Wells. Wells lost to Vinicius De Jesus, and the grappling affected him a little bit in that fight. And uh, I'm not that high on, on Vinicius De Jesus. He fights over in Bellator. I'm familiar with him. Just watched him fight recently a couple times. And uh, Court McGee is a better fighter than Vinicius, in my opinion. And uh, even up at, at 37 and a half. Uh, at the shape that I just saw Court coming in, he has a half uh, inch reach advantage. Not really an advantage, but he, he has the reach to hang with Wells. Uh, he's taller. He's the larger guy. I could see Court McGee wearing uh, on Wells, using his craftiness and, and uh, all the, the, the experience that he has to go out here and, and take a victory. Um, that being said, Jeremiah Wells has dynamite in his hands, can knock anybody out. I could see him really teeing off on Court McGee, but Court McGee has a granite chin, so he's going to have to do more then just land a couple big shots. He's going to really have to put a lot, a lot of volume on Court McGee to, to rack up some points and, and potentially hurt him bad. But Court McGee will eat a lot of that. Um, so my pick is going to be uh, Court McGee. And the line on this fight is a straight pick em right now in Bavada. Minus 110 to minus 110. It's a pick em fight. It's interesting. You could pick your poison, as I like to say. I'm sure a lot of you guys will be going with Jeremiah Wells. Uh, Jeremiah Wells being... Uh, you know, the younger fighter, but not by much. He's actually 35 and a half years old as well, just two years younger. Obviously, Court McGee with a lot more fight experience and, and wear and tear on his body. 31 professional fights compared to 13 pro fights for Wells. Uh, so that, that makes a big difference as well, obviously. Um, I still, I'm going to go with Court McGee here. I, I, I've liked what he's been doing recently. I think he sneaks this one out. My boy, Adrian Yanez, taking on Tony Kelly. This is a very fan-pleasing matchup right here. Both these guys bring the fight. Both these guys like to strike it out. Uh, they have different types of styles on the feet. And I, I feel that the the different types of styles they have actually will clash very nicely. Yanez obviously favoring his boxing very much. Um, he's, he's a fighter that, that's base is really his boxing. We know, that, we know the story with him. We chatted up with him. And he's a fighter that really was a boxer before anything, before he fully stepped into the sport of MMA. His dad was a big boxing fan. His dad was a boxer. Um, in his fights, he favors his hands very well, but don't don't uh, don't underestimate his kicking ability because his kicks are nice as well, and he will uh, land some very, very nice kicks as well. Tony Kelly, more of a traditional martial artist with his base. He has like a karate-type style. Um, he, he's a, a very durable and powerful a fighter, not like your typical karate type style fighter you would think of. Uh, and the fact that he, he's like light on his feet, just looking to pepper you up. I mean, he throws some power shots and really looks to carve you up with his elbows and all that. Um, Tony Kelly's coming off a big time victory over Randy Costa. He brutalized him, hit him with a nasty knee in the clinch, dropped him, went down to the mat, finished him. Before that, took out Ali uh, Al Kaisi. And then the uh, Kai Kamaka loss, which was a very entertaining fight. But there were some red flags in that fight. When you rewatch the Kai Kamaka versus Tony Kelly fight, which I'm going to get to here in a second, Tony Kelly in that fight really showed the, the, the lack of of striking defense at times. His head was very much up there, and I think that Adrian Yanez can take advantage of that in this fight. If he does that again, I'm sure he's been working on things and and trying to to work on, on keeping his hands up a little bit better and tucking his chin, but he was very stiff at times and upright when he was going in for his attacks, trying to land big on Kai Kamaka, and he was vulnerable to be hit. And I think a fighter like Adrian Yanez can take advantage of that, obviously. Uh, his beautiful, beautiful boxing, nice power hooks, very technical hooks that can land their mark. Um, I could see him tagging up Kelly. Kelly will look to engage and brawl it out with him. And uh, I could also expect uh, to see Tony Kelly trying to mix things up, maybe trying to grapple a little bit. He's been working on some things there. But uh, Adrian Yanez will be prepared for all that. Um, as far as their frames go, both 70-inch reach reaches. Uh, Tony Kelly a little bit taller, two inches taller. And uh, I think that Adrian Yanez is just going to get the better of of the striking exchanges. I think his boxing is going to be a little bit more accurate. Um, we'll take a look at the live line right now over on Bovada.lv where you will expect Adrian Inez to be a big favorite. He is. He's a minus 360 favorite. Um, Adrian Inez comes in with that, that high line next to his name because he's had some big time flashy knockouts and people kind of overvalue him because of that. Tony Kelly is a tough customer and he could easily make this fight play out closely or closer than some of you guys think that it's going to play out to be. But I think at the end of the day, Adrian Inez gets the job one way, gets the job done one way or another, whether it goes to decision or he lands that big shot. 
Um, Yanez has proven to be very durable and and competent with the striking defense. I think that he can weather the storm from from Kelly's uh, offensive uh, offensive standpoint. And I will take Yanez to win the fight. And uh, obviously, I'll be rooting on my boy Adrian Yanez. But but quite honestly, I think he gets the job done. I think he lands some crisp boxing shots. But the minus 360 line next to his name, in my opinion, is a little bit too high. And I think it should be something more like a minus 275. Uh, I see some lines on this card where, where people are getting a little bit reckless. Uh, or or the, the overall public's pushing these lines to be a little bit reckless. Uh, minus 360. I mean, there's potential for, uh, for, for people to get bit on this card, in my opinion. But we'll see how things play out. But Yanez should get the job done. Uh, I see Yanez winning potentially via knockout if he lands that devastating shot but kelly's durable and tough it, it could also go to decision as well uh yanez to get the job done julian marquez taking on gregory rodriguez uh, gregory rodriguez has really been bringing the fight as of recently he's been a true treat to watch uh, julian marquez ends up engaged in a lot of those types of fights as well uh, he's never out of a fight he could be losing on the scorecards but it's always looking to to come back and take his opponent's head head off uh, we saw him do that uh, against uh, Maki Patolo. He was down on the scorecards, believe it or not, even though he was a huge favorite, ended up getting the submission there, but landed some big shots as well. Uh, against Sam Alvey, a little bit of a slow start as well, um, and eventually they get the finish on Alvey too. But uh, Gregory Rodriguez, Gregory Rodriguez, uh, just coming off a split decision loss to Armand Petrosian. I thought Gregory Rodriguez won that fight. I know a lot of people did as well. Uh, so do, just do understand it was a split decision loss that was a very entertaining fight, a very competitive fight, a very high caliber striking matchup. And uh, I thought that he won that fight. Uh, you know, kind of interesting for me over here, man. So Gregory Rodriguez is is chilling behind my, whole, my old grandma's house uh, in Boca. I grew up on this lake right here. It's kind of a trip when I, when I was looking at this and I've seen him over in that vicinity before. But, you know, I grew up as a kid running big circles around this lake. And uh, there was a pool over down at the end when I was a kid. And I spent a lot of time with my grandparents. So uh, it's kind of a trip because for all I know, he could be right behind where I grew up, man, right there where I had Christmases, my, my big Christmases at my grandparents and all that. I'm telling you, this is legitimately where that's at over there. So uh, it's a trip. But um, a lot of fighters over there, a lot of Brazilians over there uh, these, these days. And uh, Gre Gregory Rodriguez made the trip down to Deerfield Beach. Uh, Boca Raton, Deerfield, that vicinity over there. Uh, he's been putting in work over at Sanford MMA. And um, he's a very talented fighter here. Uh, I'll tell you this much. Julian Marquez. Julian Marquez is a guy, like I said earlier, he's never out of the fight, but I'm not a big fan of the way he starts so slow uh, in a lot of his fights. He's a, he's a slow starter. We've seen him have a lot of comeback victories. Uh, if you guys remember the knockout victory he had against Phil Hawes on Dana White's Contender Series, and we talked about some of the other ones. I think Gregory Rodriguez is going to be up in this fight early. He's going to be up, and it's going to be up to Marquez if he could do something crazy and pull off some type of finish. I see Gregory Rodriguez outpointing Julian Marquez. I see him uh, doing a lot of things good against Julian Marquez, but with the fact that, that Julian Marquez will always have a major threat out there, uh, and there'll be potential for Marquez to do something damaging and potentially stop the fight. We saw Gregory Rodriguez knocked out on Dana White's Contender Series where he got a little overzealous and a little bit reckless and got knocked out by a fighter that's not even a UFC caliber fighter. Um, so, so we, you know, he's since been cut. His, his opponent, um, name slipping my mind. Hold on, I'll give it to you. And again, Gregory Rodriguez, after that loss, went out, did some work, and came back to the UFC. But that loss to Jordan Williams. So, I mean, we, we've seen him make mental errors like that and be put out. Uh, he was knocked out in his, his UFC, or excuse me, his MMA professional debut. But overall, his chin looks pretty good, and I favor Gregory Rodriguez to get the job done here. He'll have a four-inch reach advantage. He's the larger fighter, uh, the more rangy fighter, the more technical fighter. I will pick Gregory Rodriguez to win this fight. And right now, the betting line on him is a minus 200 with a comeback on Julian Marquez at plus 163. It seems like a decent, a decently high line, but I think the line's actually pretty accurate. Uh, barring that Gregory Rodriguez doesn't make a mistake and get put out, I think that he wins this fight. We got a big-time lightweight matchup here. Demir Ismagulov taking on Guram Kutalazi. Kuta, let me try that one more time. And this one's been a tongue twister for me. Kutatalazi, the Georgian fighter. Uh... If, you don't, if you're not familiar with Garam, the Georgian Viking, he's a very talented fighter and has a victory 
over the very talented Mateus Gamrat in his UFC debut. It was a split decision fight. A lot of people thought that Gamrat won that fight and that Gamrat should still be undefeated, but nevertheless, it was a very competitive fight, and Garam showed some real flashes. He throws some wicked body kicks. His kicks are very, very uh, powerful. He's a very competent striker. He's been putting in work with Kamzat Shimaev, uh, so, so that's obviously going to do wonders for him. Um, you see him over here with his brother, his uh, Georgian brother, and Marab Dabashili. We know that these Georgian fighters are serious. They're very serious uh, very serious athletes and very powerful guys, just very prepared fighters. And again, the fact that he's training with Kamzat shows me that he's working on his wrestling and grappling and his striking has, has already been very impressive to me. All right. So just understand he's a, a serious threat. Um, now his opponent, Demir uh, Ismagulov, Demir has been a guy that just knows how to get the job done. A very, very solid and, and polished grappler. Uh, if you're not up to par there, he will rip you down to the mat. He'll control you down there. Has a very underrated jab. Uh, has some underrated boxing skills. He's not so aggressive, but he's he's patient in there, and he'll pump the jab, and he'll score points on you. And when you look to to uh, try to press things after you're down in the scorecards, I mean, he'll take advantage of those things. He'll take you down if you get out if you're out of placement with your footwork, or if you're just a little bit. Um, reckless he will take advantage of those things he's a very cautious and cerebral fighter uh and that, that's something that you you have to admire uh putting in work over at american top team now going into his last fight he had a pretty long layoff and that again was almost a year ago going into that fight it was almost a two-year layoff before he fought rafael alves and then he went in there got the job done rafael alves is an underrated fighter in his own right and he's a very explosive fighter he, he threw some offensive um uh, explosive attacks at Ismagulov. Ismagulov weathered those types, those storms, did what he had to do to get the job done. I think this is a similar type of fight, but I will say Guram, in my opinion, is a more talented fighter than Rafael Alves and poses a, a larger threat. I could see Guram really landing some heavy body kicks, scoring points there. And, and if Demir can't figure that out and, and pump the jab and score his own points or uh, get takedowns where the fight's not taking place in the feet for, for too long of a period of time. Demir needs to clinch and wrestle. If he's not able to do that, Demir could be in trouble here. And I know some of you guys might be surprised because I know a lot of people are very high on Demir's Mugulov, as I am. But his opponent's legit, legit here. And it's going to come down to the wrestling exchanges, in my opinion, those grappling exchanges. If Demir can hold him down and score points there. And now we talked about it earlier, about these judges not valuing just just you know simple control or getting a simple takedown and not doing damage so demir will have to get takedowns and score some points down there uh garam was taken down by mateus gamrat a couple times when he was out of position in that fight he was taken down a couple times but understand how the judges are looking at things uh i think it does value garam to an extent i still am going to pick demir ismagulov because i've just been very high on him i know he still needs to prove more but i i just like Fighters that are very well prepared in all fields and are very cerebral and technical. And Demir is all that. And I am going to pick Ismagulov to win the fight. But I think that there's a real, real chance that he drops this fight and tastes his first defeat inside the UFC. Um, and if you're looking at at this fight from a betting standpoint, you'll find it interesting to see a line next to Demir Ismagulov's name of minus 165, which shows you that the threat is legit because Demir constantly comes in as a, a giant favorite and uh, he has a serious opponent in front of him here. This is going to be a, a fun fight to watch. And right now, um, or excuse me, uh, Demir will have a two-inch reach advantage to try to pump that jab, uh, even though he's an inch shorter, uh, just from a, a physical standpoint. And um, I'm excited for this fight. I really am excited for this fight. Let's see how it plays out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with Demir uh, to get the job done. So you guys know we always analyze these betting lines through Bavada.lv. This is the sports book that I use. If you guys are interested in signing up to Bavada.lv, reach out to me. I'll send you my referral link. Please don't go signing up without reaching out to me first and then asking for my official plays for free. Reach out to me first, please, guys, so I can give you my referral link so I get credit for the referral. We will both get bonuses to our accounts. I'll help you uh, learn how this, this sports book works. It's very simple. Everything is just so neatly put very it's very all very clean the payouts are so easy reach out to me if you guys want to sign up and i will give you my entire 
uh, all my plays for free. I'll give you my entire uh, betting package for the card for free uh, for, for the weekend. I'll give you my sports betting weekly plays as well. So reach out to me if you're interested. Joaquin Buckley taking on Albert Duryov. Uh, Albert Duryov came through, made some money for me in his UFC debut. Uh, made some money for, for me on Dana White's Contender Series when he came through there and looked to be just an absolutely devastating fighter when he went out there and took out Child Bittencourt the way he did. Just bum rushed him, was smashing him up against the cage and then eventually uh, locking in that submission. Uh, but I will say this, the, the performance that he just went out and put on against Roman Kopilov, a guy that I'm not high on, was very, very disappointing. And I, like I said, I had action on him. I had a parlay with him and Kamzat on that fight card. If you guys remember, that was that fight card that w was taking place uh, early in the day uh, if you're in America. And Durov, first off, never went to the wrestling or the grappling early, which I was very disappointed to see because that's his real strength, in my opinion, was engaging in the in the striking department, uh, putting himself at risk when he didn't need to be putting himself at risk. And then uh, just, just let that fight play out a lot closer than it needed to be. And uh, I worry about that because if he does that against Joaquin Buckley, I think there's real potential for him to get hurt on the feet. I think there's real potential for Buckley to style on him and outpoint him. Uh, Duryov is a guy that's been falling in love with his striking, and I think it could be to his detriment. I really do. Um, I think that Buckley is very live to land a big shot here. I've seen some holes in Duryov's uh, striking defense. <clears throat> now, if Duryov can go out there and mix things up, I think he could really have some success. And, and I mean, really mix things up. I mean, throwing a couple strikes, going to the takedown, going to the clinch, outworking Buckley, um, really going to his strengths. He can't just go out there and try to make this a uh, striking affair. And I don't have full confidence that he's going to go do that. I, I really don't. Um, interestingly enough, check this out. Look who's side by side right there in Vegas. Um, Buckley and Duryov. So these guys are familiar with each other. Um I think that benefits Buckley to, to an extent. Um, it, but Buckley will have to stuff those takedowns. L look at Buckley here doing a little race with this girl. He thought he was going to... There was a... If, if you're watching this, so basically Buckley... Uh, this girl has a thing. If, if, if you can beat her in a race, you donate $5. If she beats you, you donate 10 So either way, you're donating to a good cause. And uh, if you're watching this, you're going to see Buckley get smoked right now by some, some, uh, some girl basketball player. And she smokes him. So caught him off guard there. But uh, Buckley is, is a phenomenal fighter. Still has one of the best knockouts of all time. Uh, not, not just in the UFC, but in the sport of MMA. One of the most more spectacular knockouts you'll ever witness. And um, I like Buckley's attitude. I like everything about the guy. And I'm a fan of his. He's coming off two victories in a row. Took out Abdul Razak Al-Hassan. Cashed an official play for me. Uh, took out Antonio Arroyo. A knockout victory there. And then he, he got caught by Alessio De Chirico, of course, but overall, his, his striking has been looking phenomenal. The knockout over Jordan Wright. Um, I'm going to take the underdog Buckley here, and we're going to pull up the line. You're going to see Buckley's a dog, and that's just based on the fact that you know uh, a lot of these these Russian fighters with the grappling in their pocket, they get a lot of respect, but uh, Durov, he's a minus 210 favorite with a comeback on Buckley at plus 170. Just understand that Durov, if you're betting on him, he will make you sweat in this fight, in my opinion. And Buckley's just a talented striker. And um, I'm going to take my boy Buckley. He's just, he's been coming through for me, making me money. I'm not necessarily that confident in the pick, but uh, I, as far as from a value standpoint, I think there's more value next to Buckley's name than, than Duryov. And I could see Buckley landing some big shots as Duryov entertains that striking affair. One of my favorite fighters in the game, Tim, the Dirty Bird, means taking on Kevin Holland. What a spectacular matchup here. Absolutely great matchmaking here. Tim Means, such an entertaining fighter. He always brings the fight. Kevin Holland does the same. Uh, Kevin Holland, coming off that victory against Alex Cowboy Oliveira, started off a little slow, dropped that first round. Uh, in my opinion, Cowboy Oliveira could have easily took that fight if he would have been more disciplined, but got reckless, got caught. Um, listen, I'm going to cut right to the chase here. We know Kevin Holland's dropped down in weight. He's fighting in the welterweight division, a weight class that a lot of people believe is more suitable for him. Um, here's the thing, though, man. Tim, the dirty bird means, in my opinion, is one of the more underrated fighters in the game. Silky smooth with his striking. Underrated wrestling. We know that he's been very much engaged in, in the, the wrestling lifestyle, should I say. He's, he coaches and he does all these types of things. Um, Kevin Holland... 
Kevin Holland has a major flaw in in his arsenal, and that is his takedown defense. And I don't believe that it's been been fixed. I saw him on his back against Cowboy Oliveira in the first round. And then Cowboy Oliveira, what does he do in the second round? Doesn't even shoot. He just starts throwing bombs. Uh, we know that Cowboy Oliveira has some of the worst fighter IQ in the game. Um, I think that there's real potential for Tim Means to be crafty enough on the feet to throw a couple of shots, close the distance, clinch up, and sneak some takedowns in and take this fight. I think there's legit potential for that. That being said, Kevin Holland is, is very big for this weight class. He has solid jiu-jitsu, underrated jiu-jitsu, and he has fight-ending uh, talent on the feet. He can always knock, knock anybody out uh, in the middleweight division or in the welterweight division. We saw what he did uh, to Joaquin Buckley. You know, Speaking of Joaquin Buckley, we were just talking about him, knocked him out in his UFC debut. Um, and Tim Means is a guy that, that engages in those wars and puts himself out there to be caught, and he makes mental mistakes at times. Remember the D-Rod fight? He was winning that fight, stuck his head in a standing guillotine, got caught. But other than that, though, you know, won four of his last five fights, took out Mike Perry, Nicholas Dalby, a little bit of a step up in competition here. <clears throat> Based on the fact that Kevin Holland has that questionable takedown defense, and gets really complacent at times down on, on his back. If, if his opponent wants to take advantage of that, he's susceptible to being beat like that. And I think that Tim Means could do that. Um, now, I do feel I do feel that Tim Means may engage a little bit more so in the striking department and put himself out there to be tagged back. But I think there's an ability for, for Tim Means to land some big shots on the feet as well and hurt Kevin Holland. We saw, I mean, we saw Kevin Holland hurt recently by Kyle Dawkins in the feet. Now it was by headbutt. But before that, um, Dawkins was having a little bit of success. Not much, but the point I'm trying to make is that Kevin Holland, I, I think that people are, are thinking he's just this stud striker. I think that he has some holes there. He drops his hands at times, and I could see him being laid out on the feet. I could see him getting hit with a big shot throughout his career. I think we'll see that a couple of times. I think he'll be tagged and put out. So you, you mark my words on that. Now, I'm not sure if Means is the guy to do it, but there's potential for that as well on the feet. I'm going to pick Tim Means to win this fight, and I definitely think there's more value on him from a betting standpoint. I'll say that much. Um, well, let's find this line here on Bovada.lv. And Tim Means is a plus 190 with the comeback in Kevin Holland at minus 240. Definitely more value on Tim Means. I'm going to slightly pick Means to win the fight. We'll make things exciting there. Uh, I think the line should be closer. And... Um, We'll see how things play out. I could definitely see Holland landing a big shot too on the feet and, and finishing means. So we'll, we'll see how things play out overall. But give me give me the dirty bird. Donald Cowboy Cerrone and Joe Lozon, two legends of the game. Two fighters that that have uh, some of the most fight, fight bonuses uh, in the UFC uh, throughout the history of the promotion. Two guys that always bring it. They always put shows on. And uh, an excellent match here. Uh, as far as a, a crowd-pleasing fight, two legends up there in age. This was the right move by the UFC. Uh, this fight was supposed to take place a couple weeks back. Remember now, Cowboy Cerrone had that bad food poisoning. I'm sure he rebounded uh, fine since then. He was looking to be in phenomenal shape going into that fight, but was coming off a, a horrendous performance against Alex Morono, where he was just stuck in the mud, as Conor McGregor said when, once before uh, to him. Uh, he looked just to be like that. He, he was one of those, he looked to be stuck in the mud. He was so slow. He was so stiff. And uh, he's always kind of fought like that. He was a very upright type of fighter, or he is a very upright type of fighter with his Muay Thai. But the fact that he's creeping up to 40 years old, I think is also playing a factor. Um, I really didn't like how he looked in that fight against Morono. He's been losing a lot of fights. Now, if you go back a little bit more so, it's against higher level of competition. Uh, but Joe Lozon, on the other hand, is coming off one of the best victories of his career against JSP, Jonathan Pierce, a, a stud fighter, a stud wrestler. Um, Joe Lozon's boxing, to me, has, has weathered the test of time more so than, than Cerrone. Cerrone's fell off more so. Lozon still looks to be sharp on the feet. He landed a couple good shots in, in, on, the, on the feet in that fight. Um, yeah, now if you want to go back and fight before that, he lost to Chris Grutzmacher and Clay Guida. He got knocked out by Clay Guida. Those are some questionable losses. The Stevie Ray loss is a questionable loss. But he looked so good in that fight against Jonathan Pierce. Uh, and that was uh, that was two and a half years ago. I get it. But um, I don't know. I guess I'm what I'm trying to say is that Cerrone looked so bad to me 
in that last fight that it's hard for me to believe that he's going to rebound and look anything like he used to be. I feel like the game caught up to him. He's a guy that's taken a lot of damage throughout the years, and I have a hard time believing that he's going to look anything like he used to look back in the day. Whereas I know it's been over two and a half years since Lozon did that, but you know Lozon looks to be in good shape. He stays active in the gym. And uh, he looked phenomenal in that fight. And I think you guys see where I'm going with this. I think Lozon's going to win this fight. I think they're going to throw down on the feet. And I think Lozon's going to be a little bit more crisp with his boxing than Cerrone. I think Cerrone get, gets stuck in that stiff Muay Thai stance. And when he's looking to throw kicks or whatnot, he gets countered and gets clipped. And we'll see him bloodied up and we'll see him swell up like he always does. Um, remember how he looked against Tony Ferguson. And uh, I can see the fight potentially being stopped uh, by the swelling and damage that he takes to his face. I, I could see that. Now, is there potential that Cerrone comes out and, and is more motivated than ever and looks to be a little bit better than he has recently and, and takes this fight from, from a fighter in Joe Lozon that has ups and downs from his performances? Of course there is. Uh, but but I'm going to say that Lozon lands some crisp shots on the feet. If it goes down to the mat, both these guys are very, very polished and skilled down on the mat. Both these guys... Um, black belt, uh, jujitsu black belt caliber fighters. I don't know if they even have their black belts. I think they both do, but they're, they're Brazilian jujitsu black belt caliber fighters down on the mat. And I would really be intrigued to see how they match up down there as well. Um, and I just don't see any reason why Lozon can't get the job done here. And I'm, I'm a little confused to see the betting line, uh, the way that it's been. I know Cerrone has the big name. It's a, he's a minus 170 favorite, but the comeback and Lozon on plus 140, I think this fight should be capped very, very close to even. I think that the line should be like minus 110 to minus 110. That, that's how I'm feeling about this fight. So uh, value more so on Lozon. And I'm going to pick my boy Joe Lozon. I'm a big fan of his. I'm a big fan of Donald Cerrone's as well. Been watching him way back to the WEC days. One of my favorite fighters in the promotion. But um, that, that performance that he put on against Morono was very, very questionable. And he froze up and he kind of gassed too. And he was eating all types of shots. I think Lozon can land some shots with the boxing. All right, we hit the main event here. Calvin Cater taking on Josh Emmett. Two explosive strikers. Uh, Josh Emmett does have that wrestling pedigree. Let's not forget that. The longtime team, team alpha male product uh, came into the sport of MMA with a wrestling background, but has loved and loved to engage in striking wars where he's really shined with his power, knocking guys out. Uh, he's a fighter that hasn't been so active you know, over time, uh, his last fight was in 2021, before that 2020, uh, before that 2019, he's averaging about a fight a year. Um, so not, just not the most active fighter, but went out there, finished uh, Mursad Bektik, a very talented fighter, knocked out Michael Johnson on the feet, just recently defeated Shane Burgos and Dan Ige, two underrated fighters, victories over Ricardo Lamas. Um, the knockout against Jeremy Stevens was a tough one. I was there live for that. He got caught in that fight, engaged in a war. It happens. Uh, and that, that could be something that, that happens in this fight. Calvin Cater, we know the deal with Calvin. One of the more talented and polished boxers in the sport of MMA. I'm very, very high on his boxing skills. I'm extremely, extremely impressed with the way that he went from being beaten down to a bloody pulp uh, in the first fight of 2020, right? It was the first fight of 2020, or excuse me, I stand corrected. The first fight of 2021 against Max Holloway, and which was one of the most uh, brutal beatdowns that we've ever seen inside the octagon. And then the way he bounced back to go out there against Giga Chikazi in the first fight of 2022 this year, the way he went out there and, and just shined and bullied and beat down one of the best strikers in the division in Giga Chikazi. Extremely, extremely impressed. Uh, it proves to me, or I have confidence from seeing that, that he could hang with Josh Emmett on the feet all day uh, and be able to avoid that that big knockout shot from Emmett. I think that Cater's uh, volume will be a lot, a lot for Emmett to handle. And the fact that Emmett is so willing to engage in the feet as well, I think that Emmett will be in some danger in his own right. And I think there's potential for Emmett to be knocked out here. Um I'm definitely siding with my boy Calvin Cater. Just uh, he, He's a bull. This guy's a, he's a pit bull. He's a bull. He's a, a moose, whatever you want to call him. Just throw a bunch of, of animal names at him. This guy is just an animal. Um, he, the damage he could take, the granite chin he has, and then you mix that again with the technical abilities in his boxing game, the underrated takedown defense. I think that he should be able to stuff uh, anything that Emmett has going on 
in regards to the wrestling offensively if Emmett wants to try to take this fight down to the mat with his wrestling uh Calvin's rangy great footwork he'll stuff those takedowns and he'll keep this fight on the feet where they will go to war they'll brawl it out a little bit Emmett's not going to just uh fall over uh I think that Emmett will bring the fight, and, and we don't want to underestimate him as well. But Cater is going to be the better fighter here, and he's going to prevail, in my opinion. I feel pretty confident about that. Um, Calvin Cater, the number four ranked fighter in the division, fighting the number seven ranked Josh Emmett here. Uh, so this is a fight that carries a lot of weight in the division, and I expect this fight to take place on the feet, where I think that I think that Calvin Cater gets the job done, and I'm excited to see him get this victory and then push his way back. To the, to the top of the division and maybe get some rematches or whatnot. Maybe get a rematch from Max Holloway. We'll see about that. Um, maybe he could ch shake things up and, and uh, change the course of history or change how things went in the past. So uh, who do you guys have in this main event? I'm very excited to see this play out. Who do you guys have in this main event? Comment below. All right, guys, that wraps up UFC Austin. I'm excited for this fight card. I'm going to say this much as we close out. I told you guys earlier, we are on, we are on absolute fire Hitting play after play after play after play after play after play. Seven in a row. I feel extremely confident about the spots that I have. Hopefully, you guys are betting wise out there. Be cerebral. Be cautious with your bets. If you're drinking, be cautious. If you're down, don't start chasing your bets. That's what I want to say to you guys. It's a, it's a very important message that I want to constantly throw at you guys. Uh, do not chase your bets because you will drain your account and you will wake up the next morning feeling like a piece of crap. All right, guys? Uh, so that's my message to you guys. I know we're going to hit four profitable events moving forward. 2022 has been really, really uh, on a great trajectory. Expect big things to come. You guys know the routine. Reach out to me if you want to work with me and want my official plays. All right, guys. Signing out. Tell her. Welcome to the show. This is the MMA fortune teller. Yeah. The MMA fortune teller. The teller. The teller. The teller.